Welcome back to the Two Muds Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Marshall, and we are powered by Sheena Boychuk, uh, presented by Sheena Boychuk Real Estate. So thank you to uh, Sheena for uh, being our title sponsor uh, for another great, uh, great episode here. Uh, we have our uh, co-host, uh, Clay Vanderham. Bandy, how's it going? Bandy is dandy. I'm in the, uh, uh, for those that have minor hockey, I'm in the lull of the minor hockey season that is tearing rounds and all that um, get placed. So it was a pretty quiet weekend. Nice. Um, did anything happen? I don't know. Did I miss anything? Yeah, well, we might get into that. We'll see. Um, and we also have a newcomer, a uh, co-worker of mine up in Fort McMurray. We have uh, Mark Strickland. Uh, Strix, how's it going? Good. How you doing, guys? Good, good, good. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, our biggest guest in the history of our podcast. Uh, he is uh, the legendary uh, color commentator for the Edmonton Oilers. And uh, you can find him on uh, Roger Sportsnet during the regional coverage. And the- Legendary. Yes. And the uh, host of uh, Oilers Now from uh, 5 to 7 on uh, 630 Ched. He is uh, in the top five of podcasts on Apple Podcasts. So I got to swing that back to you, Bob, because you always do that to me about... Uh, Give me the plug on helping out there, but uh, we like to welcome back to our uh, podcast, uh, Bob Stoffer. Stoff, how's it going? Now, when you say I'm the biggest guest, do you mean I'm like the fattest and the heaviest of the guests? Is that what you say? <laughs> no, no, no. We, uh, I don't know. Chris Digman might have that that record, but uh, Ooh, what? <laughs> well, must be something about the guys that played for the South Side Athletic. There you go. The yeah. SNCC. Yeah. Yeah. He was a lot better player than I was. Yeah, that's yeah. all I'm going to tell you. Yeah. I saw him. His girls were playing before we practiced a couple nights ago. I know it was yesterday at Meadows. Yeah, it was a shootout. They played edge. Like, He's coaching NEX. Yeah. Okay. And I think midget, midget girls. I'm gonna guess. Okay. All right. And he's looking big, is what you're saying? He's a big man. I know. He's always been a big guy. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Bosco. Like, <laughs> no, like, I'm just saying, like he's a big guy. Bus, I ain't getting on his bad side. No, I'm not. no, no. no. You're could... done. <laughs> yeah, he yeah. was a legitimate, you know, eleventh forward. You know, could fight the light heavies if he had to fight the heavies, and he could play a little. Yeah. Etched out a pretty good career for himself. So I always I, admired what guys like that can achieve. How's that yeah. for being politically sensitive? Yes, Love it. yes, exactly. Um, so Stoff, uh, unfortunately, we got some uh, we're getting you on when there's some uh, not the greatest news to report. So obviously, a huge win last night, and probably the uh, the best performance they've had uh, this season, in my opinion. It was a really good game. I I thought that they played uh, in Seattle with a big win, and hopefully, it translates to uh, some uh, so a heater here as a uh, Co- our co-host uh, Brody McIntyre likes to say hashtag heater but uh, unfortunately the unfortunate news is uh, Jay Woodcroft is out Dave Manson's out um, and Chris Knobloch's in with Paul Coffey uh, your initial thoughts and uh, I know this one's a bit tough too because uh, you know it's a it's a livelihood it's a job and it's a, it's always a tough situation when uh, and the role you have where you uh, you guys get to do the the, the meetings with the coaches uh, throughout yeah. the yeah yeah, well, there's definitely, and good for you for noticing that, Josh. There's a there's a human element to this, you know. Like, um, I was a fan once, you know, uh, in the late 1990s into the early 2000s before I got my own show and sort of like the, don't get me wrong, I did the Golden Bears play by play '89 to '92, and then again from '98 to '08. But really, when I started doing my own show on 1260 back in uh, 0203, that kind of changed the nature of the relationships. Now you're seeing people on a daily basis. And and so when you're a little bit removed, you at times can have, and it, it, you might have more of a critical eye, but also there's the human element that you're frankly not privy to. And I, I can tell you today was a hard day. Like, I've known Chris Knobloch since 1999 for 25 years. I've probably mentioned him on our on Oilers now and on our broadcasts 6,430 times over the last, certainly since he really took off in Kootenai back in like 2010. Um, and I'll get to a couple of the side stories because there's an interesting connection to the university and how he ultimately ended up in Erie, and I'll get to the specifics on that. But the reality is Jay Woodcroft came up on February 10th of 2022, and he and Dave Manson did a good job. You know, the Oilers played five playoff series. 
They weren't great in the, in the first quarter last year, but ended up, I remember I got murdered on air for saying, for standing by 47 to 52 wins. They finished with 50 wins when the team was 21, 18 and three. And I've probably spoken to Jay separately over the last six seasons, at least twice a week. Okay. Either in person or face to face. This is a hard situation. You know, when we got to know him when Todd McClellan came in in 2015. Um, and then when Jay went down to the farm, I interviewed him every Monday on orders now, but I talk with him every Thursday because I wanted to have a separate, because that's due diligence for a job. So from a human, like I generally speaking, I don't personally, I've had this conversation with, with Wayne Gretzky and he's agreed with me. You know, changes during the season are hard on, on teams. Uh, but I also know what Chris Knobloch can do. And I know what, where his coaching tree is from. Like Nick Saban is considered by many to be the greatest college football coach of all time. Well, he's from the Don James Don James uh, coaching tree out of Washington, where Warren Moon played. You know, he was he in it. You know, and spent time at Kent State. And so Chris learned from Rob Nob uh, from uh, Rob Dom and. You know, Chris, Chris's attention to detail and the structure and process that his teams play with, it's been noticeable wherever he's gone. And that's, he's been a head coach for 12 years now. Yep. So it, it's part of you is if you're gutted for the guy losing his job. I'm not, it's not lost to me that the fans, you know, I, I, I see what the fans say, you know, that's not lost to me. And the other part of me is excited that Chris is going to get an opportunity here to see if he can get the elevate the Edmonton orders and see where, where where they can get going. I could tell in your voice this is a tough one, Stoff. Um, you know, and in the industry that you guys are in, uh, you know, and now a lot of broadcasters talk about uh, you know the meetings that they have with the coaches before games and, and whatnot, and that's with uh, with a camera and a microphone and and all that there. Um, you know, and Gene. Uh, Gene Principe told me a story uh, uh, last year about uh, Jay Woodcroft and the kind of person he is and uh, the, the human element in, in that side. Uh, there was a young kid that was uh, got to uh, got to meet him and some of the other players. Um, can you kind of talk about maybe the, you know, the, the humble side of him and, you know, the, the great person he is. And obviously there is a, you are going to miss someone great, but you're also bringing in someone that you know very, very well too. That's yeah. great too. Well, I think in, in I think in uh I just see in the text come in and the calls come in. Um I think in Jay's case, first of all, we have a lot of kids today, and I know Vandy, maybe you see a little bit of this, but there's a lot of kids that come from families now that have money. Jay did not come from a family that had money. Okay. And, and his family had to scrape it together. And he literally, I might've been a better player to him than 14 or 15, but he found a way to get to Alabama Huntsville. And uh, now my family didn't have any money either, but I have an appreciation for guys that aren't gifted or handed anything. And he ended up, you know, working with uh, Babs in Detroit and, um, and then went with Todd to San Jose and sort of elevated up the coaching ranks that way. Uh, and, and then took the job at the end of the uh, disappointing Oilers 17-18 season. Peter sent him down to, to Bakersfield. He made the most of that. He volunteered. He did, you know, uh, he did an event every year for us. Now it was a client event for Chorus. Uh, never second, like didn't have to you know, put the heat on him to get him to do it. He committed to doing it. He recognized that sort of thing was important. Uh, but that's a partnership. He did lots of, you know, he did. He volunteered his time for dinners with Mark Spector's charity. Yeah. Think about that for a second. Yeah, right. That's right. pretty interesting. Right. Yeah. Doing, uh, some of the media in the last few days with Spec. <laughs> yeah, no, we all, we all saw it, right? Yeah. So, you know, and, but so he did a, like he did a lot. He did a lot of that and he was aware of that and he recognized um, 
the impact that it can have, especially here, especially at Edmonton, right? So you're asking me, did he get it? Did he understand it? Absolutely, he did. And But I will say this, most people in hockey get it. After a while, some guys get they get burnt a couple times and they get a little bit more selective. But Jay was certainly open to – I'm not surprised, uh, Josh, that you have that story. Yeah. Yeah, I just it was amazing when Gene told me that and, you know, how much that, that story – and changed not only that kid's day, but also changed his father's day and, and yeah. that moment, you know, and that was something that Jay, uh, he did, he wasn't even, it wasn't even on a schedule for him to do that. He actually went out of his way and brought that kid and that father into a situation that, uh, yeah. made awesome. day. yeah, exactly. Um, you know, obviously the tough kind of comment stuff and obviously online and, you know, there's some other podcasts as I drove back to uh, Edmonton today to, from Fort McMurray was, you know, Cates gets, uh, you know, Paul Coffey behind the bench and Connor gets his coach behind the bench. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but I guess your comments is probably going to be filling up your text lines tomorrow. I don't know. Well, there's, I mean, the reality is, uh, let's see, Matt, he was the head coach, first year, Daryl on the team, and then Pat Quinn for a year, and then Rennie for two years, Kruger for a year. So, Matt T, uh, Quinn, Rennie, Kruger, Akins was number five, Nelson, interim number six, Todd, seven, Hitch, interim eight, Tippett, nine, Woodcroft, 10. This is 11 coaches. Yeah. So when, when you have that many, like, you know, there's now the irony is for the eight years before that, it was McTavish. And I remember getting texts and he, well, actually, they weren't texts, you guys, they were emails to total sports yes. complaining that the orders had stuck with Kevin. I'd, I'd been too focused on continuity with Kevin Lowen and, and, and Mac T. And so now the bottom line is the team is three, nine and one, and there's supposed to be a legitimate Stanley cup contender. And there were reoccurring themes that were undermining the Edmonton Oilers. And when that happens in a results driven business, sometimes changes get made. Yeah. So from criticism, uh, you know, the owner has spent money. He built an arena in concert in a 3P deal, and he hasn't been afraid to make changes. Yeah. Uh, and that ends up costing him more money. So, but I understand people say not enough continuity. I, I see those texts too. Uh, and then, what? sorry, what was the second part of it? I yeah, I guess this is with Connor getting his coach behind the bench. The narrative yeah. was is that is Connor turning into the LeBron James of hockey where, you know, he's got an <laughs> agent there and now he's got his coach there. And okay. well, first Let's of all, how many, down. how many championships did LeBron has LeBron won? Like four, three? Three or four, yeah. I'm not an yeah. Well, I yeah. sure in hell hope Connor wins three and four here. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah, but exactly. uh, uh you know, I, I think Jeff Jackson kind of See, here's the thing. Ken Holland is with the team all the time. So he does talk to Connor and Leon and those guys. He's around the team all the time. And Jeff, as due process occurs in his role as CEO, and I'm not going to put words in Jeff's mouth, but he has to defer and allow Ken to have, to continue those sort of relationships that he's had. He, Ken's the day-to-day -day, uh, executor of sort of the other's management uh, direction. So... I, you know, I don't think that for one second the the Connor McDavid I know would, if anything, double down on Jay. Yeah, he would, because he doesn't want to fail. He's a good guy. You know how you can tell he's a good guy? Because there's no goddamn drama about him. Nothing. Okay? There's no drama about him. Like I, I know the guys in Toronto talk, and the one guy there that used to be on the whatever on sports net oh you know he's about four times now he anytime the others are in peril this guy's tweeting that mcdavid is gonna leave or whatever that that's his citrix arrow there so right and he's he's oh, the first God. guy the moment the moment the leafs lose he's burying the leafs too yeah people um, don't listen to that shit do they like, well yeah. no but i what i would say is i look at connor and i go and i said this on the air and guys in prince albert got pissed off but i was like you know 
when a player commits to a place like Erie or PA, and, and it, it shows his character. Because you go to Erie in the OHL, or like Ryan O'Reilly and Connor McDavid did, or you go to Prince Albert, like Leon Dreisettle and Caden Gooley did, it tells you you're focused on playing. And we can relate to that at Edmonton because there's been a few players along the way that didn't want to play here. 100% and right. there'll be so, more. So I have greater admiration and respect the unique challenges that Erie and PA have because at the National Hockey League level, it varies. To, we're not in that position right now because we've got two of the best players in the world that attract us, you know, free agents. But – I just, I just look at McDavid, and I, I don't think there's been a lot of histrionics with him. I don't think he's ever undermined a coach because it's not his DNA. Do you know who's most disappointed that Jay's that this has happened? The guy, like Mo, the most disappointed guys are Connor Leon because this has coincided with for the first time ever a cold snap in their career, yeah, where they got one combined goal in the last ten games. And you know they're they're the leaders in the team, and this team isn't winning. So I I I know for a fact that it's not like McDavid went in there and said, "Damn it, you got to hire." You know, you, now what you do need to do is figure out. Okay, so Jeff and Jeff Jackson alluded to it. Jeff Jackson got Alex to bring it. Jeff Jackson got Connor Brown. Connor Brown was a six. I don't have to tell you this, Josh. Connor Brown was a six round pick of the Leafs. Alex to bring it was an undrafted player into the OHL. And Jeff got those guys as clients because he watched Erie because that's where McDavid was. And oh, by the way, who coached Erie? Who did he see dozens and dozens of times coaching Erie? And oh, by the way, Knobloch went from winning the WHL championship in Kootenai, going to the Memorial Cup, to having the only coach in major junior history, four 50-plus win seasons, to having good power plays and low goals against do you know how hard it is to win 50 games four consecutive years in a row in junior? It's what, never what, happened before. What <laughs> makes what makes Knobloch, Chris, a, a good coach? Like, what – yeah, he's structured, and, you know, I would think most NHL players are, but but li- what makes him a good coach? What? Well, Vandy, you watched – I don't know how much the availability you saw today, but he talked about – I didn't – I didn't. Okay, he talked about finding a way to get the most out of the players. Yeah. And, and working with the players and giving them a little room to breathe. I think he breeds offensive confidence to players, but he gives everybody a role. And, and is that is that ultimately – is that what Woodcroft – I I think that there might have – there was there was something lost in translation with the lack of contraction with certain guys. Okay, now, I, now, now. Conversely, they were very specific with Vincent Dernay. Like, yeah, they had Dernay in the minors, and he played. He played in spite of warts and all. Like, you know, he's not a great yeah, player, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they kept him in there, and he killed penalties, and he had a defined role. But you know, Holloway finally got going last night. McLeod, I know he's been injured. I wouldn't necessarily blame it on coaching, but the players got to accept responsibility too. But the Knobloch that I know has structure and process in the game. His team's going to play zone defensively. They're going to play an assertive neutral zone, and they're going to pressure the puck to get the puck back. And his teams tend to score, and they tend to have low goals against. And that's very intriguing for me. And he seems to be able to develop players because he took players that were undrafted midget players in the OHL and turned them into $9 million players in the NHL. So, right? Even like Will Will Cooley. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Like Will Will Cooley's up with the Rangers this year. Played one year in the minors. It's a second round. Like, he's not a high pick. You know, we're sitting here with Borgo, and we're not sure. We're not sure with Borgo at this stage. But there's Cooley, and he's up with the Rangers in a second pro year. So, so, so with Knobloch coming in, do you foresee some movement po- possibly from Bakersfield? Some of because because I think right now everybody can agree that we did we don't have that sandpaper, we don't have that meat and potato, Clint Costin, Bukestad type of player that can fit that role. Mark, what do you think? Do you think they lack mm-hmm. some character depth players? Uh. I'm not too keen on the bottom six of the Oilers. I got to be honest. Yeah. I, I'm a little disappointed with the lack of production. 
especially this season, like one goal, one goal from your bottom six, that doesn't look too good. Uh, but one you thing got, I you got one goal with. from your top two. That so <laughs> I mean the the team as a whole that says everything. The team as a whole is struggling, right? I don't know. I find they were riding those top six too hard. I found those guys were getting too many minutes in some of the dire games. But it's nice to activate those bottom six a little more. So maybe this. The, uh, and I wonder good. whether or not you'll see a little bit more balancing of the minutes. Yeah, and I do tend to. I think they need some different dimensions, and I don't know if it's in, they've got that internally in the organization right now. Like, I don't know how many six foot two aggressive wingers they have down in the American Hockey League. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I think you need a, like they need Nick Delorier. That's the guy I would be going after. Well, or if you want a real deep guy, and I've mentioned him before, LA's got him in their organization. A guy like Hayden Hodson that played for Knobloch in Erie. Yeah, you've been you've been very high on him for a while, for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, and he was, uh, I was high on him, and then he ran over Mark Stone in the preseason and got it going with the Vegas Golden Knights. But he can, the thing is, he can do that. Yeah. I'm not sure if he's a full time NHL player, but he has a dimension. And the others, I think, and, and he part played of this, eerie, didn't he? Stoff. He he bounced yeah, around he a bit in the O, but he had a huge season two years ago with the Philadelphia Phantoms. Jason Smith, Adam. Yeah. with Ian LaPerriere uh, in Lehigh Valley. So, I mean, and you know, it's funny. We've gone in. Well, how, how long are we in this conversation here? About 18 minutes or so? No, more than that. Tw- yeah. About 20 minutes. Yep. So, one thing that didn't, like, why are, why are the Oilers ultimately, and so I'm going to push this over to you, Manny. Why are the Oilers in this position right now? What's the number one thing as to why Edmonton's in this position right now? Three, nine, and one. What's the number one thing that they haven't been able to do all season? Convert. Yeah, I, goals I, against. Yeah, I mean, well, the, but 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 Bob, that's minutes. a that's a reoccurring nightmare for us fans. You Whenever I mean? that, it, every thirty-five or forty games. Hmm. Yeah, you got to go to that go to that goals off the rush stat too. That's a pretty interesting yeah. stat that we've given up. 20 goals off the rush. Are we talking? Are we going to be talking analytics? Because I'm going to hang up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, no. the stat, the stat, hey, the I, I go. Here's a. As, the numbers as a, don't lie. I've, I've coached for quite a few years. I, 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 I've kind of embedded myself in analytics. But again, I coach minor hockey, so I don't get into it all that. I look at the eye test. And yeah, okay. And we're right back to where we were. And, and, you go back to maybe the coaching and why would you change something that isn't broken? I mean, you just had a team lose two years in a row to the eventual Stanley cup champions and hard fought um, Colorado, maybe not, but, but regardless, why would you try to change your, your style or your team style when, I mean, what, what are so they you- switched to zone defense for the start of the regular season. There's an old saying, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Boston and Vegas play zone. You can win playing man-to-man. Carolina plays Mm man-to-man. A lot of teams play a hybrid. Todd McClellan coaches out to hybrid. Jay coaches at hybrid. Todd McClellan had the perfect neutral zone to play against the Edmonton Oilers. It's a 1-1-3. It's not even a Mm -hmm. 1-3-1. They call it a 1. It's not. It's a 1-1-3. They flood the line, yeah. Right, and then they and you got to chip and chase and go get it back, and it mitigates off scoring chances. So what's happened here is every team in the league has been focused on counter punching the others, limiting chances off the rush, and then they uh, they basically build a perimeter wall around the goal to, in the defensive zone, and especially on the power play. Mm-hmm. Like Bouchard needs to be shooting the puck three to four times in the first 25 to 30 seconds. Of 100%. Everything. And if he breaks a guy's ankle, he breaks a guy's ankle. And if he breaks a guy's stick, he breaks the stick. And if it deflects and goes in, it goes in. And well, it, what's the old saying back in the day where our coaches go, you nail one right between the eyes of the goalie and then put one right on the ice. That's the kind of mentality. That's Bobby that. Hall. That's what Bobby Hall well, used to do. The what, first one. But that's the mentality. Heat, baby. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. That's the mentality you need to have. You if they're going to drop right those four guys down mm-hmm. and, you know, give them that shot, take the shot. So anyhow, I mean, look, Jay tried. Yeah, uh, they tried to convert some things. I don't think it worked. 
to be honest with you, if you looked at the advanced numbers since the Calgary game, they're pretty good for Edmonton. You know, uh, now I will tell you last night against Seattle, I was in the building. Seattle stunk. They're down 4 nothing after one. They got four shots on goal in the second period. Are, <laughs> are you serious? Like, they had nothing going. Like, they were awful. So, um, but there's no question they've got to limit the amount of odd man breaks going the other way. Boy. they got to give up fewer goals. And it was surprising that there wasn't a huge focus of that during today's availability. I found that interesting. They made a bet on Jack Campbell. To date, it has not worked. That's part of the reason they're in this position, right? They've they've accelerated Skinner up, uh, and he had a tough. St- hey, it's it's been a it's the sophomore jinx, Maddie Beneers, wow. one goal minus fifteen in his first fifteen games this year after winning Rookie of the Year. Stu's got two wins in goal, and he's got an eight sixty save percentage. It happens. Yeah. What yeah. do you think if I could ask you, Bob, about this? Uh... What do you think about, like, we know the Oilers have foot speed, but I watch some of these games and I'm looking at the puck speed's not there. Like, the puck speed yeah. out of the D zone, the puck speed through the neutral zone, maybe a little more one-touch passing on the offense. Like, are you seeing that where they're just kind of operating in straight lines and maybe sometimes even holding the puck too long? Mark, the puck does the work. Right. So I have a friend whose son, he's going to be really good. Okay, he's gonna be good. He's already huge at fourteen. Keaton very like any word of advice for my my uh every every, every episode, but, Bob. You're you I know, I know I love it though. I love it. I gotta it. get a jersey. You gotta get me, tell him to get me a jersey of wherever he's playing. Yeah, but you know what? Great like, and what he said, said, So what's the key? And I said the key is the five foot pass. The puck does the work. You guys know that. The best guys share the puck, the best broadcasters share the mic which I've not done in this interview. I apologize. No, you've done a great job. You I'm always the do. Selfish guy that I am. No. Yeah. No. I so, like yes, that. to answer your question, uh, Mark, absolutely. They And the the one player in particular for me is, is, is Darnell Nurse. Like, he can transport it, but transitioning it's always better. And the Oilers had, the, in my opinion, the best transition defenseman in a lot – the second best, because the best transition D was Nicholas Lindstrom. The best transition D in the league in the last 20, second best was Chris Chris Pronger. He Whoa, could play yeah. the game in a rocking chair. Beast. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, Good point by you. You're smarter than the other two guys that are doing this. Just so you know. No, yeah. I watched a lot of hockey. <laughs> That's an analytic question, though. I don't do that stuff. I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, so what do you think happens here with Jack Campbell stuff? Do you think obviously Elliot Freeman, uh, you know, he's a contributor on your, uh, your shows on Wednesdays on where there's now, um, what, uh, where do you think happens? With what, what did he say? He said that they were working on a big trade involving a goaltender on his latest episode on the 32 thoughts podcast. So, um, and then something just fell through, um, you know, leading into like I think it was like Friday's show. So, is 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 a podcast on Friday. So we'll see what he has when he's back on with you on Wednesday. He's supposed to be on with us too, but I think you'll probably have him on before we have uh, you. We he comes on. You'll you'll he'll be end up being on your show before he's on ours probably. But uh, um, your kind of thoughts on you know Jack Campbell? Obviously, he I think he spoke to the media down in Bakersfield and. Really? Um, yeah, and he said that he was actually surprised by the move, and he was a bit, little bit disappointed because he thought he was playing well. Um, your overall thoughts on kind of what he had uh, he had said there, and I know he didn't have the the greatest uh, performance the other night uh, against the Abbots. Well, I mean, the Oilers had to do something in goal, and he has a contract that nobody was going to pick up on waivers. Correct. Yeah, like he's got similar numbers to Skinner. Skinner was up for the Calder Trophy last year. And it's a 2.6 million cap hit. Like the others would lose Skinner on waivers if they put him on waivers. Again, this is sort of along the same lines of what happens with Jay. Like we have a personal relationship with, with Jack. Uh, he, I know he wanted to come in here and excel. The others did a lot of investigation on Jack. Um, and in fairness, you know, I remember Josh, you raising some concerns with me privately saying, stuff. I don't know if he's going to be able to, you you I think you said to me like that's you know 
There was you know, there, I, there were some concerns, and I and I felt there is a reason. So why. what were those concerns? Because I yeah no I just mean in terms I don't of think Jack Campbell got a fair shake here. Here yet? Yeah. I thought he's I thought he's gotten more than a fair shake in my opinion. Like you know he had especially this year he had the great preseason, then he got the game an opening night. Now I'm not saying yeah, but if we're losses, talking about a coach changing a defensive structure, I get it. You need saves. And I mean, we're not talking the goalies of a couple of years ago. But, but if you want to date I mean, back to the playoffs, yes, he didn't get a fair shake because maybe, like, I don't know. The, the thing that I took away from the press conference today, I know, Vandy, you, you didn't get a chance to hear it yet. Mm-hmm. But the fact that, you know, Ken was, Ken Holland spoke that he was been a part of some of the video sessions and, and meetings with, you know, with Woodcroft about, and then, and it kind of tied back to, you know, maybe some of the players sitting. I don't know who which reporter was asking that question. I don't know if it was Rob Tichkowski or, or uh... well, the most the most surprising move to me this year was, you know, Broberg's an eighth overall pick, and I thought in theory he was going to be playing further up the lineup. Then Kulak, first of all, I call missed all the training camp at thirty three, and then, then Kulak gets hurt. Um. But in the third game of the year, the orders were in Nashville, and Broberg was terrific in that game. Yeah, I was stunned they pulled him out of the lineup in Philly. Yeah, that and put Darna back in. Now the coaches, Jay, Jay, and and Dave Manson have history with Darna, and they didn't have a lot of history. Like they also have history with McLeod, and what and what, a lot of history with Broberg, and a lot of history with Holloway. Right. What so what they, people don't understand is is you say history, but it's trust. There you go. It, that's, it's that's, it's as go. a coach you oh you know on ice yeah maybe Broberg is obviously he's better than Dayarnay or you know perception may seem that but as a coach you know that Dayarnay if you draw an X in the corner Dayarnay is going to go to that X Broberg may take the S route or or well the only difference to to that you know what I mean that I'm just but Vanny here's it. here's the thing I'm going to guarantee you you're going to see the orders play tighter gap on opposite. They are not going to give up as much time and space as teams come in their zone. They're going to have their D and that's something that Broberg does better because of the skating ability than Darnay. Yeah, Nurse okay. was playing too deep. Kulak was playing too deep. That is, I'm going to 100% guarantee you that is going to occur over the next couple of weeks. I that's know it's the gap, gap control off our blue line. You're talking yeah, about. it's going to, it's yeah. going to vastly improve. Yeah. Now, in fairness to Jay, one of the areas that he targeted was the work back to the puck when he took over from Tippett, and that improved in the back half of that year. Okay, it was the forwards backtracking and working hard to support the D. But I'm going to guarantee you, the D on this team are going to be gapping tighter. It's coming. There's no question that's going to occur. So, but but isn't gapping tighter? Isn't that uh, something you learn in? In, in Bantam, Midget, Pee Wee, you know, like what, what, or is that just the system they were playing? Yeah, I don't know. That well, space. he switched a little bit of the neutral zone as well early in training camp and pivoted from that. Yeah. I understand why they did it because they wanted to lower the goals against because they had six, they had six one goal leads against Vegas. So what you're saying is funneling back into their zone. And and just instead, kind of you're protecting see the house kind of thing, right? And instead, what you're going to yeah. see is you're going to see them be more assertive and take time step up, step get, up. Yeah, yep. they're going to have to get the work back to the puck from the forts yep. as well. I uh, and you're going to you're going to give up less grade A shots that way too, right? And that's where like their analytics, like they led the league going into last night's game, they led the league in shots for. They were number one or number two in expected goals for. And Corsi and Fenwick, they were top three. But too much of their shots were from the perimeter, and the scoring, the caliber of scoring opportunities they gave up, uh, were, were amongst the worst in the league. Yeah. And then the save percentage, going into last night's game, their expected uh, goal saved above expectation. I know I'm geeking out on you here, Vandy, <laughs> but their goal saved above. <laughs> last night was the three nine and ones. That was the thirteenth game of the year. Last night, yeah. they were minus fifteen in goal saved above expectation. <laughs> So uh, you look at Vancouver, they're shooting the lights out under Tocket and Demko right. and DeSmith are stopping everything. And the others aren't getting stops 
And the two highest scoring players in the league since 16, 17 are in a, are, are in a top, they're, they're in one right now. They're in a slump and it yeah. never happens. Right. Yeah. So, you know, what's going to happen is there's going to be an automatic analytics bounce back here. I mean, Berkey used to call it when he come on orders. Now you guys used to call it the dead cat bounce when the new coach comes in, even a oh, dead cat boy. bounces. I've actually just, you know, I've never seen a dead cat bounce before, but yeah. I, I, I don't even know if you can use that term anymore. I don't Lay know. the house on the oil to beat the aisles tomorrow. boys. Well, I don't know about that because the Islanders got Ilya Sorokin I know, I know. and he made 50 saves against them last year. Yeah. But I do know this. You'll see the team gap better and you'll see the team transition the puck out of their own zone better and i think you'll see their players a little freer because i think they're waiting for something to happen yeah there was a uh, little bit it's a very much, good point very good little, point right so and i say i fully expect jay to get another nhl head coaching job and i think he'll be successful when he gets that opportunity i think he's the next head coach of the san jose sharks that's my opinion down, down really down. yep i think so i think he will be the next head coach of the sharks that's just Oh, I well, he is an NCAA guy, so that'll help him because their whole organization's from the NCAA, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But he did play at Boston University, so that might because got I mean, yeah, it's going to hinder him a little bit. They got a lot of BU connections. There. <laughs> <laughs> um, final one, we'll uh, finish out on this. Uh, I don't know. Do you have anything more, Mark? There that before? Uh, one, the only other thing I wanted to ask, I would ask Bob's opinion on this one. What What do you think about the timing of all this? Uh, with the with the movement of coaches and with Jay being fired, like did it seem early to you, or were you kind of one of those guys that said, "Hey, depending what happens in the San Jose game, I think it'll be a telltale." Or were you thinking more? I, th- the, I thought it was game, Mark. Or? Mark, I thought it was important three games on the road. I'm pretty sure I. Yeah. I think Josh looked at doing something on Tuesday night, and I, I my I'm like. Yeah, that would be a good time to do it because I knew it wasn't going to happen before then. But, you know, again, in a results-driven business, okay? And don't forget, we have a new sheriff. Yeah. Jeff Jackson's the CEO. Yeah. His I mean, fingerprints are on it for sure. Like, right? And he, he, this is a coach he knows. He knows this coach because this coach – see, it's funny because I – and I know I've discussed this with you guys. I looked at what Wasserman did in developing their second round picks. And, you know, you take a look at the 2016 second round, they hit the home run, man. This got Wasserman. That's yeah. What the, the agency that Jackson was with. Oh, got yeah. Sorry. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, and they like, they're, they've done a better job developing than some NHL organizations have done developing. Okay. So, and, Jeff would tell you that coaching played a factor in some of those guys, like a Debrinket. Right? There's a guy who Chicago took after the Oilers took Tyler Benson. So, okay, you just, like, a hockey agency, like, they're the agents, right? Yes. they. Have, you just said developing. What, yes. okay. Explain that. So they have uh, Dave Gagne, and then they have their people that work with their clients. And no spend- shit. Oh yeah, and oh yeah, I didn't know that. I, well, oh yeah, I, that's what the best agencies do. They have because remember when you're an agent, man, you're you're working with all 32 NHL teams. This is yeah, amazing. but I I just thought I'll be honest, naive is all shit. I I thought they just they're money guys. It, it's just they're there to get. No, them. no, no, no. The best agencies to that today play a vested interest. We have a bottom draft. Jeff, I, Jackson, I, I Jeff, Jackson, Jeff Jackson and Jerry Johansson were tipped off on Keaton Verhoff at 12. At 12. Okay. Because there's not a lot of six foot two, 12 year olds that are right shot the fence. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, so where I'm going with this is like they're, they're on it and they're playing the long game and they're working with these kids. to. So they all have camps in the spring. They all have camps for their kids. Yeah, that we're, and, we're close. I, with, I we're close with Elaine. Wow, well, obviously you know right. that pretty well. I didn't know that. Uh, I, I, yeah. So Sorry. Johansson does a camp in Vancouver, and then in either Edmonton or in Saskatoon every year. He's got two separate camps. Yeah, for his Western Canadian kids, and so they would bring. I've done events with Johnny Boychuk and Colton Pareko to talk about the two different career paths. You can go major junior like Johnny did. 
or you can go AJHL into the NCAA like Colton did, right? And then talk about their respective journeys and what it's like and, you know, how Colton, or certainly in Pareko's case, sort of a, he was a third round pick. Not a lot of people knew a lot, a little bit of a late bloomer physically, but part of what happens with those players is before they ever get to the draft and they continue to grow and develop when they're younger. And that's something. So Jackson has best of practices because he deals with all 32 NHL organizations. 100%. Right. And so, but development isn't just up to the team. The real agencies that are serious, they're helping develop the players too. Make no mistake about it. Yeah. Yeah. They're heavy involved in it. So um, yeah, so my final question, Stoff, is uh, can you clarify the role that Paul Coffey had before this uh, assistant coach? Will he still carry that role, or is he just going to be the assistant coach? I actually think the move is going to go good because I tie it back to what Vancouver has done with Sergey Gonchar and Adam Foote, you know, two pretty good defensemen in their own right in their NHL mm-hmm. days. Paul Coffey is. Um, you know the re- the 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 recipe is uh, is there. I didn't like what Matthew Huanik said on his show today that uh, he said that Paul Coffey walked into uh, Arizona and just said this is what we did back in you know the eighties as he was trying to run the power play. I thought that was a bit of a a jab, and I know I'm not trying to jab at other podcasts or whatnot. I'm not. And you don't know, Matthew Huanik. People are people are entitled to their talent. They, they, and they can hear. I I I'm gonna hazard a guess that Matthew probably wasn't in that. room room in arizona yeah uh, yeah was i yeah um, or was i but i just i i, I think this is going to go good because i do think the positivity side of this with you know paul being around these guys you know having the the respect from you know what he's done as a in, in his playing career and you know i he's a student of the game you know he loves the, he loves hockey so um and I just think i look at vancouver and i think one of the biz, biggest success and you know you said it with Vandy, um, how uh, I did say Vancouver was going to make the playoffs, and yes. you did, you did, yeah, you did. And, and you I didn't say all, they were going to win the division. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they're going to win the division. But they are, yeah. I know, I know, but they are, they, they are, are good. So, so it's not just Gonshar out there. Like, do you know, no. who was out there? when we were there a week ago Monday, do you know who was on the ice? Sadines, Sadines, yeah. So there, you're there. So. And that speaks to an openness from a coach as well. Yeah. Right? They talk it's so he's I mean, could you imagine being a fourth line guy and the Sedines are sitting there working on face off <laughs> working on like right. you're looking up, and there's <laughs> arguably the best Swedish forward of his entire generation. Correct. Um, you know, they do have Mark Stewart as well as Paul. Uh Paul uh, you know, Paul the one the, there's been a bit of a and, and maybe Vandy, you can speak to this, but um, you know, we get CBA mandated off days. Today was supposed to be a CBA mandated off day. And back when Paul played, you practice every day. Yep. And the Oilers practice at a tempo and pace that other teams didn't match. And there have been times where there's been some teaching that's gone on here that slowed down the pace of practice. And yep. I think it's manifested into some challenges in the game. 100%. And I that's am back. Good. I am going yeah. through that with 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 my midget kids right now, where it, you spend you're going through. So the Oilers of the old uh, Brett Brent Sutter, the, the Red Deer Rebel, they love flow. They want 45 minutes. I can get a good practice. Max 45 minutes. Right, right. And but when you slow it down and you got to explain, you got to be here when that puck's there. How long, so Vandy? How long are you on the whiteboard with the kids? Uh, for those practices, what's probably, the longest you're on the whiteboard explaining a drill? Probably 15. Oh, just explaining where to go. Like, are that, you talking? Well, oh, no, 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 no. Like, when in a you're on practice, the ice during the practice, practice, two minutes. I draw yeah. the X's, the O's, and away you That's go. It. Get them going. But when you're doing system work and stuff like that, you sometimes Longer. you got some of that can be done. Can some of that can be done in the room? Correct. Some of that can be done on iPads, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So right. I guarantee you that you'll see the orders have better gap. It wouldn't surprise me if we had a little bit more energy in practices too, just as an FYI. I, I could foresee that because I think there was an implementation of some new system stuff that they pivoted away from. And uh, so we'll see. But uh, yeah, I, 
I'm going to be really intrigued to see how this goes because I think this guy has a high ceiling, obviously. Yeah. I mean, Josh, you've been listening to me for years. I've been talking about Chris. Oh, yeah. Now, can I leave I... with a story about how fickle life is? Yes, please. So in 2010-11, the Kootenai Ice gets the Memorial Cup final. Do you recall what happened to Kootenai that year? In the, oh. Within the first five minutes they of their fired. first game. The coach got fired. No, no, no. Braden McNabb destroyed Joey Hishon with an open ice hit and got just knocked, just knocked out, kicked out of the game for the hit. Hishon never recovered. He had a massive concussion, never recovered as a player. And he was playing for Kootenai? No, he was playing for the OHL team. And McNabb was the star of Kootenai, his defense. Okay, He had 27 points in the playoffs that year. So now Knobloch doesn't have his best defenseman for the rest of the tournament. Kootenai doesn't win the 11 Memorial Cup. Um, long story short, in 2012, the Vegas Golden Bears job opened up. The problem was that Jeff Chanel owned Kootenai and only gave Chris a specific window to which did not coincide with the U of A closing the position. And word had leaked out either directly or indirectly that Knobloch was interested in that job. And suddenly he wasn't the coach of Kootenai anymore. He lost, So Ian Herbers got the head coach job. Ian had co- Nobody would have thought that Ian Herbers would leave the American Hockey League to coach the U of A. You got to understand the U of A at, at that time was maybe paying double of what Kootenai was in the WHL for a head coach. So that was in the summer of 2012. In the fall of 2012-13, Robbie Fatorik was coaching the Erie Otters. He had a brutal personal matter to deal with. He resigned his position, and they needed a coach. And the Oilers had been assisting Sherry Basson with some stuff. And Sherry is from Saskatchewan. Chris had taken Kootenai to the Memorial Cup. And suddenly, Chris became the coach in Erie. Whereupon, he became the first major junior coach ever to have four consecutive 50-win seasons. Two with Connor, two after Connor. It's almost impossible to do. He could have been the head coach of the Alberta Golden Bears. Today, he is the head coach of the Edmonton Oilers. And Ian Herbers had a successful run at the U of A, then joined the Oilers staff for three years, and now he's back at the U of A. It's a fickle business someday, my friends. It is. Stoff, thank you so much. I will see you tomorrow. I'll be at the rink with the uh, U15 Double A Maple Leaf Athletic Club. Track. Oh, not the not the MLAC guys. Yes, oh, the MLAC guys. Bob. Mooners we coming over to, to say there. hi. Johnny Boychuk's coming to say hi. So uh, maybe we'll get uh, the Southside Ath- uh, Athletic uh, player here, Bob Stoffer, to come say hi. You did last year, Stoff. So. Hey, hey, by the way, Mark, I just want to say. You did a great job, and it's it's clear how you wield the babes. Number one, it's the stash. Number two, you're a man of few words. It always works. He does. I got, I'm rocking a mullet and a muzzy. Mullet boy. and a duster. Dude. And there a you go. Like, it's, unbelievable. it's an awesome look, man. Yeah. That's the Alberta look. He's I a, love it. <laughs> this guy's like a, a girl one, either, i do it. This guy's one of the biggest beauties on site. So oh. uh, he's been, uh, he's good. I know he's going to be raring to to go to tell my and brother. And you shake his hand, he's going to bust every knuckle in your hand. <laughs> Not my hands, bud. You ask Josh. Yeah, good job. Good job. Good job. He's actually shorter than you, Stoff, in person. So he's, he? but, yeah. I know one thing. He's definitely thinner. Yeah, he is actually. Yeah. But uh, he's got to get you on the. Oh, you look pretty good, Bob. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Flattery will get you everywhere. You yeah. got to get the smart guy on again. There, uh, uh, he's gonna come on for sure. Don't worry, he's been uh, all right. Okay. Awesome Thank- stuff, guys. Thank you. Have a good night.